So for now, let's turn to the text. Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 7 today. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain, and he called to him those whom he had desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to cast out demons." He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonard, ah, I'm going to mess this up this time, aren't I? Bonarges, that is the sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. You know, whether we realize it or not, as we look at the world around us, there's something that is constantly going on. God is steadily at work fulfilling his promises. Whether we see it or not, whether we acknowledge it, whether we can, whether we can identify it, God is at work fulfilling his promises and he is accomplishing his sovereign purposes. Every single day. And and, and this 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 is so much more when we read through the word. This is so much more than God knowing what's gonna happen and telling us things that are gonna happen because he just knows it. But no, this is God declaring before the foundation of the world. This is God promising in space and time through his prophets. And this is God bringing to completion through his ordained means for his glory. God is at work. And you know the most amazing part? God chooses more often than not to accomplish his sovereign purposes by raising up average men, average women, to accomplish his eternal purposes. That's amazing. He doesn't need us. But he chooses to use us. He doesn't pick the best and the brightest all the time. Sometimes he does. But as we go to the text today, what does Jesus do? Jesus shuns the masses. He he bypasses the cultural elite and the religious elite, completely bypasses them. And he chooses 12 ordinary, fickle, hard-headed men to be his official representatives, to be his apostles, to be his disciples, and to become the very foundation of of God's promised new covenant community. The thing that we know as the church. My main idea this morning, the text, there's a couple themes that are going through here, but we're gonna be kind of focusing as we especially get to the end in application towards the concept of discipleship. And so the main idea that we'll be working on this morning is this, that Jesus ministered. He certainly ministered to the countless masses, but he poured his time and his energy into 12 chosen men. Yes, he ministers to the masses, but Jesus spends all of his time and energy really focused on 12 chosen men. So as we begin here, I want to begin with this where Mark starts. He wants us to see this, this unparalleled scope of Jesus's earthly ministry. 
You know, because sometimes, you know, you might watch a show about the Gospels or about Jesus, and it's like, well, you know, Jesus was kind of this unknown guy, and he kind of wandered around. Not many people really, really, you know, knew what he was doing during his time. And that's not what the text tells us this morning. I mean, the text tells us this morning, Jesus is not some regional backwater prophet up on northern Galilee kind of doing his thing with nobody knowing. That's not what the text tells us. He's not some secret rabbi. We, we have here that, that, that his ministry is eclipsing the ministry of John the Baptist. Because back in chapter 1, verse 5, John the Baptist has everybody coming out from Judea and Jerusalem. And when we're with, when we're with John, we're like, wow, that's pretty good. Everybody from Judea, Jerusalem, they're coming on out to the Jordan to visit John. But when we get to Jesus... If, if we actually transliterate and just like literally translate the, the, the Greek here, we have a multitudinous multitude of people coming to see Jesus. A multitudinous multitude, and they're coming from every point of the compass. Now, now I know some of you are geography nerds, but most of us aren't, right? So we got a map. As we, as we look at the map here, and I know it's kind of small, but that, that, little, that little sea up at the top there, that's the Sea of Galilee, and the, the northern tip of that would be somewhere about where Jesus is ministering, okay? Now, let me read through these places where people are coming from. They're coming from Galilee. See the, the, the red spot on the side of the Sea of Galilee? That's the region of Galilee. So we're talking people are coming from the west. Judah, where's, where's Judah. Well, that's the region down in the south, kind of that large, green, it, actually Samaria, Judah, and the bottom, Idumea. But that's to the south. We've got people coming from, from the south. Not only from the south, coming to see Jesus, but we have people coming from the religious heart and center of Israel. They're coming from Jerusalem. And they're even coming from further south. They're coming from Idumea, which barely fits on our screen at the bottom. It's right on the border with Egypt. They're coming to see Jesus. On top of that, they're coming from the east, the region beyond the Jordan. We're talking on the east side of the Jordan River, which is Decapolis and Perea, that whole region there to the right-hand side. They're coming from the east. And they're coming from the north and northwest in that they're coming from Tyre and Sidon, which are up on the coast to the left-hand corner of the screen. People are coming from the north, south, east, and west from the farthest reaches to see Jesus. And that's pretty impressive in the time in history when most everybody's traveling on foot. Tyre and Sidon, 50 miles. 50 miles to come and see Jesus. But I think he wants us to see something more than people traveling long distances. Commentator David Garland points us to the fact that Mark isn't merely trying to impress us with the massive crowds, but he wants us to see that, that, that really what's happening in Jesus is that there's some initial fulfillment of, of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 43, starting in verse 5. Jesus the Messiah is here, new things are coming, and he's starting to inaugurate the kingdom. Verse 5. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring. Where am I going to bring them from? The east and from the west. And I will gather you and I will say to the north, give up. And the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I found and whom I made. We have people coming from every point of the compass to come and see Jesus. But even more interesting is the fact that if we look closely at these areas, they're not all Jewish areas. Sure, Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, those are Jewish areas, but, but Idumea down in the south, that's kind of a real hodgepodge mix of Gentiles and Jews. And we get up to Tyre and Sidon up in the north, and that, that's, a, that's a Gentile country. Which is interesting because Isaiah's prophecy in verse 8, let's pick it up there. Bring out all the people who are blind yet have no, but blind yet have ears, who are deaf yet have no ears, blind yet have no eyes, deaf who have no ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. 
Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right and let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declare the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that you might know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. In this one prophecy, we have Jews, Gentiles coming in. Not perfectly, as we're going to see clearly in the text. But it's starting. God's calendar is moving, and he's at work. Jesus is the promised Messiah, and he's coming to fulfill his promise, not only to Israel, but his promise about the nations. And Jesus is coming to save everyone who believes in him. That's why he's come. So we have this, this chaotic scene as we kind, of, we kind of move from the crowds funneling in. We come into Jesus. Yet as we get to the crowd, Mark tells us that the, that the crowd is really more interested in what Jesus does than what he says. Right? Because what do they want him to do? Everybody's throwing themselves forward in the crowd in an effort to touch Jesus and to get healed. Jesus is trying to get a boat to get a little bit offshore to get a buffer zone so he can preach because why did he come? I've come so that I might preach the good news, right? He's come to preach. But they're so focused on his miracles, they're not hearing his message. All they're focused on is what they can receive from Jesus physically, not the reason he came. They don't, they don't see the supernatural truth that the demons clearly see as they come in contact with Jesus. So you see, notice, any time the demons are confronted by Jesus, what do they do? They fall down. They all do the same thing. They declare Jesus is the Son of God. They confess his true identity. No struggle, no fight, no question. And once again, like in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus does the same thing. He commands them to be silent. And I think, as I was looking at this text, I would propose an extra reason why Jesus is commanding them to be silent here. Because on one hand, what are they doing? They are proclaiming the truth, right? Demons are proclaiming the truth. I think when Jesus is commanding them to be silent here, he's making it very clear. Their authority comes from two different places. Two different places. He, he's, he's, he's not going to allow demons to proclaim something and make it, make it look like somehow they're in league because actually what's going to happen Two weeks from now, when we come back to Mark, because Chris will be here next week, is we're going to see an accusation by the Pharisees that Jesus is casting out demons by the prince of demons. So, so that, that's going to be one of the connections we, we see. So here, he's shutting them down because he's like, I'm not in league with you. And it's good for Christians to remember. Demons have better doctrine than most practicing Christians. They have better doctrine than most practicing Christians. But it never produces faith. It never produces joyful worship. All it does is confirm their imminent judgment. That would be James chapter 2, verse 19. Even the demons believe and they shudder. There's a belief that you can have that's like a demon's belief. It doesn't prove anything. It doesn't accomplish any end. Supernatural truth severed from the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit is incapable of eliciting a positive response. That's what we see. Because what are the devil and his demons constantly trying to do? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, 
It's veiled to those who are perishing. Why are they perishing? In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. That's what they do. In revealing Jesus as the Son of God, you know that whatever they're trying to do, they're trying in some way to blind. Trying to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jesus doesn't cooperate with demons. Rather, Jesus binds demons and he banishes them to the abyss because they are his unyielding enemies. He doesn't need their witness, and he doesn't need their work. Jesus is actually going to reveal himself to whom he wants, as he wants, when he wants, and it begins in verse 13. And he went up on the mountain, and he called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He He doesn't need their witness. He's going to establish his own witness in these twelve men. And in this text here, I'm gonna I want to highlight two things. This this message was kind of hard to get together this week because there's kind of two levels moving through here. And so I'm going to highlight two things. One is we're going to, we're going to take a, a moment to touch on God's sovereign plan that's at work here, and then we're going to focus on the means by which God accomplishes it. So we're going to look at those two things. So we're going to see, first of all, there's a significant development in God's redemptive plan in these verses, okay? There's a development of what God is doing. Whether you realize it or not, this event is, is, is so packed because Jesus, when he grabs his disciples, he doesn't call 11 disciples. He doesn't call 13 disciples. He doesn't call 50 disciples. He calls 12. He calls 12 disciples. And every first century Jew reading this text of Mark is going to be picking up on something. Huh, 12. 12 has been through my entire childhood. 12 sons of Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel. I know 12. And Jesus chooses 12. Jesus is starting to build his new covenant people. The promised Messiah has arrived. And he's building it From who? Ethnic Jews. The new covenant people. Where does it begin? It's beginning here. Twelve Jews brought together to establish the new covenant people. A remnant of of God's old covenant people who he's going to use to bless all the families of the earth. That's what he's doing. And, and we've, we've seen this, and especially today. Matt touched on it in Gospel Foundations. It was great because they're kind of both coming together at the same time. It's neat how God does that. But let me take like 90 seconds to kind of highlight how I see this. There's, there's a couple different views, but I think it's helpful for me to walk through this. Number one, there's a lot of debate about this, and it can get really heated. So let me be f- clear first. I don't think the church flat out replaces Israel, okay? So, not there. I believe that the church is the restored new covenant community that God has promised and that Israel's prophets anticipated for centuries. That's what the church is. He promised this time, new covenant, when he'd he'd build this people, a time when God would forgive their sins, he'd write their law on their hearts, and he'd put the Holy Spirit inside of them that they could finally walk in faithful obedience, something they couldn't do unless God did a work of their heart. They couldn't circumcise their own heart. That's why in Deuteronomy 30, God says, there's coming a day, I'm gonna circumcise your hearts. But that's new covenant, not old covenant. See, this, this movement has always been God's plan A for the redemption and restoration of mankind. The church's plan A it's, it's God's plan A for salvation for Jews and Gentiles alike. But this isn't saying we disregard our older brothers. Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. 
Lest you be wise in your sight, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. Yeah, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The church begins mostly with Jews, few Gentiles. As time goes on, much more Gentiles, way more Gentiles than Jews. But throughout history, there are still Jews coming to faith in Jesus. And verse 26, he says, and in this way, after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. I take this to mean that Jesus will call a massive number of ethnic Jews to himself through the gospel before he returns. Not done, but during this time, there is much more happening because of God's sovereign plan with the Gentile nations and the Jewish nations. And we could spend hours unpacking all sorts of stuff right now, and that would better fit in a Sunday school class or a seminar, not a Sunday morning sermon. But I think it's helpful, just, I, just, I just want you guys to know how, how I'm seeing the text, because there's always questions when it comes to that. And I also don't want to miss some very practical things this morning. So I said there's two levels. We're looking at God's, God's redemptive work. We're looking at God's sovereign purposes and his plans and how he's working it out. But there's a whole other side to this. Is that the God, God is choosing to work out his sovereign purposes through 12 guys. 12 guys that Jesus selects. Notice, notice, that, notice that Jesus selects these guys, okay? And this turns the entire disciple-making paradigm of, of Jesus' day on its head. See, if you wanted to be like a disciple of a great rabbi or a teacher, you had to go follow the guy around. You, you had to go chase him down. You wanted to say, I want to be a part of this thing. And you had, to, you had to kind of show you could keep up and you could do the work. And then, and then after that, then they would finally let you in. But you had to put all the effort in on the front side to get accepted. And that's not what we see. Jesus calls 12 guys. 12 guys to be his inner circle. 12 men that he desired out of all of these teeming crowds to be his men. And I know sometimes it's easy to think like, you know, well, Jesus knew their capabilities. You know, Jesus is kind of like, you know, he's like that NFL coach. You know, he's scouting out the scene, he's checking everybody out, and, and he's, he's pursuing the most talented prospects. Have you ever read the Gospels? <laughs> you read through the Gospels and you look at these guys and you're like, oh my word, what did he just say? <laughs> it's amazing how they stumble and how they fall, how they don't understand. It's clear Jesus isn't picking these guys because they're the sharpest tools in the toolbox. It's because he's choosing to use them. I mean, even through the entire ministry, we get to the end of the book of the Mark, and they're still struggling to understand Jesus' ministry and his mission. They, they're, they're still struggling to put everything together, even after being the 12 people that spent three years with Jesus. And, and I think in this, we see, we see a glorious gospel truth. And I think it's this, is that God loves to glorify himself by divinely choosing and using the least likely. God loves to glorify himself by choosing and using the least likely. Two texts. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. Moses talking to Israel. And Moses is pretty blunt. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. Verse 7, 
It was not because you were more in number than, than any of the other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. You were the fewest of people. You were nobody. God, God chose you. You were nobody. He, he could have chosen so many other people, but he chose you. And he's made you what you are today. There's only one reason that you're, you're this large nation that he's delivered out of Egypt that are poised to go into the promised land. It's because he did it. I mean, you read further on, I mean, and he catalogs their stiff-necked nature and their rebellion against God, and it's all of these reasons why God shouldn't have chosen them to begin with. But God did. New Testament text. 1 Corinthians 1, 26-31. Christians hear this. For consider your calling, brothers, Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. Okay, some of you might have been wise. Some of you might have been powerful. Some of you might have had noble birth. But not many of you. Not many of you were. Now, now here we get, but. Listen to this contrast. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. That's good for us to hear. When we think about what it means to follow Jesus and to be his disciples and we look at all the kinds of ministry that needs to happen and, and how hard it is to do the things God has called us to do, we keep looking around for the most qualified people all the time or people that have it together more than us and we forget that this is how God works. God loves to take the rustiest, dullest tool on the shelf and use it for his glory. Let me get to verse 30. Talking about not boasting before the Lord. Not, not, not thinking that we're so low and we're so ineffective and we don't have what it takes. Verse 30, and it's because of Him. Speaking of God, it's because of Him that you are in Christ. Why also is there no reason for boasting? It's because of God that you're in Christ. Christ who came to us as wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's what God loves to do. It's love. God loves to work. Jesus doesn't call the most qualified people to be his disciples. He qualifies the called. That's how he works. That's how he works. The, sec- the second thing I want you to see in here is, is how, how Jesus calls his disciples and what he's trying to do with them. We, we see a twofold mission when, when Jesus calls his disciples. What does he want them to do? He wants his disciples to be with him and then for the purpose that he might send them out to preach and have authority over demons. So there's, there's two things. He's calling them to himself. The purpose of the calling is actually not just to coddle them and and to have them in close all the time, but actually so that he empowers them and sends them back out for ministry. And in this, what I want you to see first and foremost then, is is it discipleship? When we talk about what does it mean to be a disciple, and we've been talking about that, our, our mission as a church, to make disciples of our neighbors and the nations, right? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. What's going on in that discipleship process? It's moving people from unbelief to belief to begin with. You can't be a disciple if you've never come to faith in Jesus. You're not a disciple by following the Ten Commandments. You're not a a disciple by following rules or attending church. You're not a disciple by taking communion. You're a disciple through faith in Jesus alone. 
Moving from unbelief to belief. That's the first step. Apart from that step, no one is his disciple. Apart from faith. But then after faith, what's, what's happening after faith? It's not that coming to faith in Jesus is punching a magic bus ticket to heaven. There's something that's supposed to be happening. There's this identification moving from where I, was no, not, I wasn't identified with Jesus to identifying wholly with him in baptism. Why, why do we baptize people? It might seem weird in our day and age where we don't like symbols and stuff. But it's a picture saying, I'm, I'm part of Jesus. In my old life, it's been dead and buried with Jesus. It's gone, and I've been raised to new life in Christ. I'm no longer who I was. I'm living a new life, and it's not because I'm, I'm an awesome person, but it's because Jesus did something. There's new life. What's happening after baptism? Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. No, notice, as much as we talked last week about not having this big list of rules to, to be measuring people by, listen to the Great Commission, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. Okay? So there is obedience. But, but life change and, and, and holiness flow out of our salvation as a response and to what God has done and empowered by the Holy Spirit, not trying to follow a man-made checklist. And what's the goal in this teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you? It's not just to be a bunch of people who follow a bunch of rules, but it's actually to be what? Disciple makers as well. Teaching them to obey means coming back full circle and taking people who have moved from unbelief to belief, who have, who have now been identified with Jesus and his people through baptism and been learning about what it means to follow him for them to join in the mission of being disciple makers themselves. There's no plateau. There's no parking lot on the side. Everybody on mission together. That, that's, that's the picture of the Great Commission. See, attachment to Jesus, being with Jesus, is for the purpose of learning about him so that we can rightly participate in his mission. That's why he calls them in. He's going to send them out on mission, but they need to learn about what it's about first. I like what James Edwards says in his commentary that discipleship is a relationship before it's a task. It, it, it's a who before it's a what. And I think it's good for us to think about because these 12 men, Jesus is calling in to spend the next three plus years of their life traveling to every corner of Israel on foot. They're going to have a front row seat to everything that Jesus says and does. They're going to see him happy. They're going to see him exhausted. They're going to see him sorrowful. They're going to see him angry. They're going to see him hungry. And in all of this, they're going to have the unique opportunity to learn how to live a life that reflects his character and embodies his mission. But the training isn't in an end in itself. And I think that that's so often in our churches where we can get hung up is we look at all these things that we feel like we need to take in and we need to learn and we, we always keep pushing off the, the service and discipleship and activity part till later on, so always saying, I don't have enough or I need to be more or, or I'm not smart enough. Where, where we're always being trained and moved towards participation in the mission. I mean, I mean, Jesus is calling these guys in, and you know what he's going to send them out to do? Everything he's already doing. I mean, they're, they're going to teach, they're going to preach, they're going to cast out demons. In, in the parallel texts, he also talks about healing. Every single thing, they're going to have the authority to do the same thing that he does. So let's move to a little bit of application. First point is this. Is when we think about discipleship, 
I want us to be always remembering that discipleship is about preparing and launching individual disciples into personal ministry for Jesus' gospel mission. That's what we're trying to do. We're not just trying to make a bunch of PhD level Bible scholars in our churches. Now, PhDs are great. Bible scholarship is great. And we need those PhDs. But when it comes to life in the church, and it comes to our mission as as these simple people that God has called from every state, some of us from higher states, some of us from lower states, but guess what? We're all serving the same God, and we're all serving the same mission. So let me put it this way. Coming or being a disciple is more than coming to church to get fed. We need to eat. But we don't eat just to eat. People that sit at home and just eat to eat, they need to cut walls out of their house to get them out into the hospital. Let us not be those disciples obese, spiritually, unfit for kingdom work. We eat to grow that we can serve. Discipleship isn't about Bible classes only. It's not about doctrine classes only. Does it involve them? Yes! Discipleship, it's not just about one-on-one meetings at a coffee shop. Does it involve it? Most likely, yes. Discipleship. What is it not? It's not a defensive posture by which which what we're doing in discipleship is merely trying to build up walls of defense against the world. We're we're, we're not just simply trying to isolate ourselves and, and recreate the entire monastic movement. That's not what we're trying to do. It's a hard world, yes. But a world that God has called us to interact with. Number two. Discipleship is a messy business. But it's worthwhile because it multiplies our effectiveness. Anybody that thinks discipleship is clean and easy needs to realize it's not. Just look at the disciples. If you think it's straightforward, me teach you lesson, you go do things. It doesn't work like that. We learn by watching, yes. And watching, then going out to do, what do we normally do, what normally happens in the first couple doings? We fail. Now, not, 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 not abjectly fail in every ways, but there's things we don't do good. Why do we have student teaching? They can do teaching, they can get feedback, they can learn better, right? And we kind of build on this feedback cycle to prepare them to be teachers. But I think sometimes in the church, we don't always view failure as an opportunity to support and build up and help people take the next step. I've heard so many people say, I tried that one time. Maybe that's you. I did that once. I'm never doing that again. So what? You messed up once. That, that, that's, I mean, if, if we all took that attitude, we'd never get anything done in life. You know, I was uh, talking with a Coast Guard commander uh, when I was ministering in Kodiak, Alaska, and he was commander of a, of a big buoy tender, and they went all over, not just around Kodiak, but they'd go all the way out into Bristol Bay and off the Nan, um, I mean, just everywhere, and they'd have to reset all these navigational markers. And um, he was giving me a tour of his ship, and um, he was just kind of sharing about leadership, and we were talking about some leadership at church stuff at that time, and so this is kind of where our conversation went, and he said, you know, I love, I love developing young officers on my bridge. 
I love developing these guys because, because I want to make sure that I'm preparing them to take command. If that's where their career is going, I want to be a positive piece of that development so that when they, when they, when they hit that place, they can take command and they can lead and they're going to be a good commander because there's a lot of bad commanders. They can be a good commander. But you know what? At the same time, it's a messy job. It's, it's just a messy job. And see, as Skipper, one of the duties that I have is to teach these young guys how to dock my ship. I have to teach these young guys who've never done it before how to dock my ship. And you know what? It's one of the hardest jobs I have. Because you know what the only way they can learn? Is by slamming it into the pier. <laughs> they, they take a big old scratch out of my multi-million dollar paint job. And then we go do it again. But if they don't learn from me, where are they going to learn? Is that our attitude at Olympic? Or are we simply judgmental on people who can't pull it off the first time like a rock star? See, that, that's, that's kind of disciple-making mentality I want us to have. I think it's the kind of disciple-making mentality that Jesus has with these 12 men. Time to be with, to hear, to see, a time to do and, and, and to get feedback and to help pick them off the ground when they blow it. I want that to be us. Because I don't think there's any way for us to be the disciple-making church that God calls us to be unless we're willing to deal with the mess it takes to get there. And the mess, it'll constantly be as we try to see new people step into new places of service. Paul followed the same practice. What did he tell the churches? Follow my example as I follow Christ. I mean, that's the kind of following we want. We want the right kind of following. Follow my example as I'm following Christ. If I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. But as I follow Christ... And what do we see about his ministry? Paul launches, I don't know how many different guys, to every corner of the Roman Empire in ministry. Men who have been with him, men he's trained and discipled, and he sends out. Because the other part of it when it comes to discipleship is discipleship ultimately means that we're also training our replacements. We all have an expiration date and it's not stamped on our heel. And one of the hardest things to do if you don't have it ingrained like the military does is to be thinking about raising up the next generation how do we hand off the things we're doing today for leaders we have today, developing leaders of tomorrow and servants of tomorrow so that they can lead the church of tomorrow? We need to be looking at replacements, whether it means picking up a ministry that we're just backing out of for a year or two or it means for them taking it on for a lifetime. Discipleship is about that. It's not about holding on to power. But it's really about empowering other people to be the leaders and the servants that we need to fulfill our mission. So as we close this morning, my simple question is this is where? Where, where are you at in your disciple-making journey? Where, where are you at? I mean, if you've, if you've been sitting in the bleachers, just kind of watching everything, taking it in, enjoying the show, are you sitting on the bleachers? I don't know, watching via video stream from home, I don't know. But 
Where are you at? God calls us to so much. And we truly believe here at Olympic that we find our greatest joy in pursuit of Him. It's not a burden. It's a delight and a joy to participate in this, though it's not always easy. What's holding you back from serving or growing today, or pulling somebody into your life, or participating in something we're doing that you know, I need to grow in this area, I'm going to get involved. Asking somebody in a ministry if you can shadow and participate so you can learn. Second question, for those of you who are currently active in serving, who are you discipling today? Who are you working with right now with whatever you're doing in this church? Are you bringing somebody alongside of you or are you just kind of running a one-man show, one-woman show? I work better by myself anyway. People can't keep up. That does nothing for the church. Should you be looking for somebody to bring in? I pray that you do. Let's close in a word of prayer.